What's cooking, everybody? Welcome back to the O Show Podcast, episode 478. We are presented by Mayweather Boxing and Fitness in Scottsdale, Arizona. Mayweather Boxing and Fitness is an inclusive, high-intensity fitness experience developed by the champ Floyd Money Mayweather himself, formulated with the perfect combination of boxing, strength, and cardio conditioning intervals designed to make you look good, feel good, and leave you with more than just a great sweat. Head on down to Mayweather Boxing and Fitness in Scottsdale, Arizona. We're also sponsored by betonline.ag you could sign up for that 50% bonus by using that promo code capital B L E A V 50 NFL wild card week this weekend make your picks uh Michael Turner you have an NFL name oh, don't yeah. you running back for the Fine. Atlanta Falcons oh, back yeah. in the day Northern Illinois great fantasy pick he's a Saluki i think it was in uh, in uh college yeah he was great i had him on fantasy one year and it was nice i had to take him one year i think i won honestly yeah, he's the man. That's a strong name. I'm also a Republican uh, representative in Ohio, 3rd District. Uh, it's a common name, Michael Turner. Starting off hot, Michael Turner. Yeah. So you, you are, you're performing, you're opening up for Trevor Wallace tonight at Stand Up Live in yep. Phoenix. Yep, That's going to be fun. I'd tell you to get tickets, but they're all sold out. Trevor's a big draw, so, you know, that's your loss. Uh, but, yeah, be opening up for my man Trevor, one of the funniest doing it, and so that'll be fun, yeah. So you, did you grow up here? Because you lived here for a good 15 years, So I right? grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then uh, when I was 18, graduated, and I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here, went to ASU. So okay. then I went, uh, so I'm a Sun Devil, and then um, back in, what was that, 05, and then I lived here for 15 years, so up until 2020. And then I moved to Los Angeles in January of 2020 to pursue my dreams and passions. And it was pretty shitty timing. <laughs> and the world was like, yeah, not that. The good. worst time of the oh my God. worst time of the uh, millennium to move to Los Angeles. Any, yeah, to try to do anything. The uh, worst, dude, yeah. Well, I was the exact same way. I grew up in New Jersey, hated the cold. Yeah, just couldn't stand it anymore. Nothing was clicking for me. Yeah. came out to Arizona, went to GCU. Okay. I've thought about moving to LA a few times. I lived in Orange County for a summer a few years back. I like Loved Orange it. County. That's nice. Yeah, it's better it. than so LA you live in L. Everybody says that they're leaving LA because it's a bizarro world. What's your take on it since you actually live there? So and I can actually ask someone who lives there. Yeah, so like that's the general perception, but you're also talking about like huge names are like we got to get the fuck out of LA, and there are already a lot of people are already established. Yeah. I'm not not at that point in, in, in my uh, time right now in my career. So I look at it like that's a huge void. Because at the end of the day, people are leaving L.A. and shit like that. And there's political reasons. You know, it's a little, it's obviously more, much more closed down than everywhere else with the COVID situation. But, like, it's still L.A. There's still uh, Fox Studios didn't leave anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Right. Sony, like, if you want to get into, like, um, you know, making film, TV, shit like that, like, you're still going to have to probably be in L.A. So that's not going anywhere. So no. I know that you can you can make your career out of a lot of different markets now, but I fuck with it. The weather's good. And, There's uh, a beach on every corner. Yeah, the, all the main... Still so many huge connections out there, and if you know how to work it, it's like... Yeah. These it's a field day. These people aren't going anywhere. UTA, all the big uh, agencies are still there. So, like, I mean, L.A. and New York are still L.A. and New York. It's just strange times. But, um, yeah, I mean, I like it. I like the weather, and... Um, I made the move with that perspective, and uh, a lot of people that were out there during it couldn't hang, and they, they, they left, but I muscled through, and I'm doing good, so I'm surviving. I think L.A. and New York are like, you know, people put them in the same boat, but they're also very different. Like, well, in Manhattan, like, growing up, like, you rarely walk into someone on the street unless, like, Dave Portnoy's doing his pizza review or something, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you rarely, I rarely saw actors just, like, casually walking on the street where, like, one time walking the Hollywood Walk of Fame... Oh. You know, like, oh, I saw Chris Pratt, there's Getty Lee from Rush. Like, they're just out and about, just hanging out. L.A. is weird like that. You'll see some shit. Um, and obviously, the the coolest thing is I do stand-up comedy, so, like, I'm up in the clubs a lot. Yeah. And, and like, three, four weeks ago, I was sitting there. I don't know if you watched the new um, Kevin Hart show on Netflix. Uh, I think it's called True Story. Pretty well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to be stressed out for seven hours, it's kind of crazy. But... I'm watching that during the day, and I literally go to the comedy store, and who jumps on? Somebody's like, Kevin Hart's about to pop on. And I'm like, what the fuck? I never even thought in my life, I, you know, he's not one of my favorites, but he's also Kevin fucking Hart, right? And I was like, holy shit, I'm sitting there watching Kevin Hart do stand-up, and, and you just, in the, in the comedy circuits, you see a lot of your heroes, which is really cool. And yeah. they're all just down-to-earth people, for the most the, part. I mean, Are there any, the like, part, like yeah. th they're considered celebrities, but do yeah. any of them act like celebrities from the ones that you've seen? I think that some of them, the, they act like uh, they're much more closed off and reserved because of the level of 
fame that they have, which I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not at that point, but I don't hate on that. It's like, I don't know how it would be walking down the street, like you're saying, like you're like gawked at and you can't even eat dinner and shit like that without somebody being like, oh shit, I love you. Right. Here, here, here. And so some of them are much more reserved in that way or guarded because they don't know who the fuck, oh, yeah. what, what other people's intentions are. Um, but for the most part, like I would say, and I'm specifically talking on the comedy celebrity shit. Um, once it, the, the coolest thing about being a stand up is once you break down that barrier of like, I'm a comic, you're a comic, for the most part, you're just talking to a real motherfucker, which is amazing because sometimes you're talking to your heroes and you're like, what the fuck's going on? What's like the greatest piece of like encouragement or, inv- or advice you got from one of those guys? Like after, after you finished your set and they came up to you just like, hey, I don't know what you're doing, but it's working. Like yeah. keep on going. I don't know. I'm trying to think. Um, a lot of it is really just them being real people and just saying keep pushing and shit like that. Yeah. Like I think getting that nod of like that was funny from somebody. Like I know yeah. the one cool thing was uh, I grew up wa- like Christopher Titus is a big name, and he probably wouldn't even remember me if he saw me again. But I'll never I won't forget. You know he was huge when I was growing up. He had a Fox TV show and shit like that. It was fucking Titus, and he sat down and watched this show that I produced called This Week Sucks Tonight. It's a very funny show. We're at the Hollywood Improv with it now, and we're, we do it monthly here in Phoenix. We're doing it on January 27th, actually, Ooh. if anybody wants to come out at the Tempe Improv. Um, and so he was working that weekend, and he happened to be at the club. And we didn't know, but he sat back and watched the show. And afterwards, he came up, and he was like, that was fucking amazing. He was, like, super impressed and, like, super complimentary. I guess he was sitting back, and he was eating because he just wanted to – chill him and he was like whatever and he ended up watching the whole thing and like you know first of all he didn't have to say anything afterwards and also if he didn't think that he probably wouldn't have that's i know how, that's how i am i would never go out of my way and be like that was funny if i yeah. didn't think the shit was funny and uh you know i don't think i'm somebody that's like i want to be like christopher titus comedy wise and shit like that but i was like damn that motherfucker's a 30-year vet and he that that's cool shit like that it, it pushes you along i mean everybody else has their own niche in comedy right like it's yeah. so subjective like it could oh, go yeah. any which direction oh yeah you know i mean you got to just be yourself and if you're just yourself you're not going to be like anybody else that's the key especially in comedy mm-hmm. especially did you start out at the tempe improv so i started out started? in phoenix actually it's funny we're up we're here in Scottsdale, if people don't know where we're at, and and uh, I started when I just lifted up here, and I w- drove by the comedy club that I started at, which is now um, some fucking you know CrossFit gym or some yeah. shit like that. It turned into some, but stand up Scottsdale was down the street on um, Indian School, like right there in Old Town, and that was my home club. That's where I started, but then I came up in the ranks here in Phoenix, and I did Tempe Improv and Stand Up Live and shit like that. Improv. Oh, yeah. There you go. That was probably, looks like a good looking me. I think that's like a year and a half ago when I had lost weight during COVID. A lot of people didn't do that, but I just started running and doing more cocaine. (laughs) Um, More cocaine? Yeah. That's how you lose the real weight. Yeah. You know, what do you do? You're bored. No, I'm kidding. I didn't do cocaine. I just ran and ate a little better. But yeah, Tempe Improv is my favorite club, I would say. Really? That's the best. It's just, and it, it has a lot of positive memories for me which is which helps so i heard when you were like starting out like you were always like the funny guy right yeah in, in your group but i heard that you had to speak or were chosen to speak at one of your buddy's funerals and you just like kind of felt the presence of the room and felt like you controlled the room so i um my best friend passed away when we were 21 and in iraq and uh brandon honor the man one of the best and he uh he passed away and I, I just remember, obviously, you know, going through the emotions, all that shit. But within the first day or so of him passing away, I called his brother. He had five brothers, but I called his brother, the one that I was closest with, and just told him I want to speak at the at the funeral. And uh, I end up, yeah, giving I don't know if you call it a eulogy or a speech of remembrance or whatever. Um, and I also thought it was important. We were 21 years old, and I know his family was going to talk, and I forget who else spoke. It was myself and one of his brothers and somebody else but i know that at 21 years old like nobody knows you better than your friends at that point you oh can yeah be, like the, you're the closest with them at that age like so your, I, your parents know who you are but but like at yeah, that age like, they don't know everything i know the fuck on, right? shit that he was doing and shit like that like we got to experience everything through high school and shit like that so i thought it was important to, s- to speak and from the perspective of his friends 
And uh, yeah, that was like a moment for me that I'd never really spoke publicly. And I'll never forget, yeah, the control that I was able to have was unique. And also, you know, I had the preacher to my right. He was laughing and he was crying. Because I was telling, you know, telling stories about what we went through. It was 21. We, we, did, we had some great memories. And I wasn't going to sit there and cry the whole damn time. And, um, yeah, I, I remember walking away from that and having people really come up to me and saying, you know, how you spoke moved me and shit like that. And it really sparked. That was a moment that sparked the idea that I should do something with my communication skill, with yeah. my ability to kind of capture a room and be able to communicate something. I didn't know it would manifest into stand up but i was always a funny motherfucker and i remember being like oh this i should probably try this and it worked out so what did you major in asu i majored in communications so what I'm, was your plan I'm, with that pff, honestly it was a degree to get a degree i, I went there yeah. to go to journalism school and asu is probably one of the better journalism schools Walter in america Cronkite, yeah. yeah and uh i also went there to drink excessively and uh Naturally. i did a little bit more of that than school and so i didn't get into the journalism school and i was like fuck so communications is kind of a degree to get a degree, and I figured I'd have that degree and make it work. And I did. I was, you know, I had a good couple office jobs and shit like that. I was getting sales, but uh, the goal really was at that point. I was like, I'm, I'll probably be a good salesman somewhere. But it's funny that I got a degree in communications, and I probably use it more than <laughs> most people that got a degree in communications. Oh, yeah. I'm out here communicating. You actually know how to use it, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, I didn't learn anything in any of my classes that have helped me on stage, but that's just a problem with education. But there's no school to be like, this is how you be a stand-up comedian. I, did, I think I did one public speaking class, actually, so that kind of helped maybe. But <laughs> So you do that. You, you, you speak at the funeral. Yeah. You're making people laugh, making people cry at the same time, yeah. which is a great thing to do, especially when talking about someone that you love and that everybody yes. loved that's there. Yeah. And I think I think it's also something to consider, like on stage, like I'm not trying to make you cry, but I'm definitely not always trying to make you laugh either. I'm trying to make yeah. you think I'm trying to make you feel some things. If I want to talk about on stage some shit that I went through, I want you to go there kind of with me, you know, not to say I want you to be sad about some shit or whatever, but I definitely want you to feel things beyond just laughter. And so that's a you know, if I need to, I'll make a motherfucker cry, too. So what would you say is your specific niche in comedy? Like, what, what would you say your style is? Has uh, it changed over the years since you started, too? Nah, I don't think it really has changed, which has been <clears throat> uh, fortunate for me because some people do have to switch shit up. But I think early on I was just kind of able to be, as cliche as it is, I was able to just be myself. That's yeah. the key on stage. Just be yourself more than anybody else and, uh, and try to do that. And so I was always leaning into that. But I'm pretty, like, we're talking right here, like, this is who I am on stage, too. I'm very, like, conversational. Um, Do you involve the crowd a lot? Uh, I mean, I can, but not really. I like I like my jokes. I think about that. Sometimes, I, I when I was coming up, I used to do a lot more fucking with the crowd, but sometimes I just want to tell my jokes. But I'll engage uh, the audience in ways with each joke. I think, you know, I'll bring them, bring them in with me, but I won't really do a bunch of crowd work that much. Um, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm very, like, kind of chill. Like, the way I'm talking to you now is kind of, that's my energy on stage, too. I just keep it pretty calm. And in that way, the punchlines, I think, kind of sneak up on you. Because I'm Which just chilling. Good. And they just, and you're like, oh, this dude's just bullshitting. And then it just, boom, and it pops. Because you're just listening. Which is great, because you don't expect it. Like, most, most yeah. people starting out, you could say, like, oh, okay, here comes the punchline. And it's, like he's it, winding it up. You could, you could, there's a lot of really good comics, first of all. But you could, they tell jokes and it's like and I, I tell jokes but like what I say when I say it like that like when you're processing it you're like oh this is clearly a joke yeah you've written a whole structured joke mine is more like I'm just kind of like finessing the punchlines in there if that makes sense um it's pretty easy going and it's fun I like doing that shit did you start out with open mic nights yeah so that stand-up scasto was a Wednesday open mic uh that's that's how I, you got to start like that I don't think you should ever blindly just be like, book me on this shit. I've never done comedy before. It's like, no, dude, go fail at an open mic. That's you Fall on your it. face the first 50 times you do it, oh, then we'll talk. Don't First of all, don't tell any of your friends when you start comedy that you're actually doing comedy. Ooh. Don't tell any of them for like 
I would say six months, or at least like three to four months. That's if you're doing it consistently every yeah. week. At least once a week, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, it was a Wednesday was an open mic night, so I'll do that. Um, there was a couple other ones I'm trying to remember, but the, it was good. When I started in Phoenix, I think if I had started like, let's say five years before, I started in 2012, so I'm coming up on 10 years in a couple months. And I talked to a lot of people. If, if I started like four or five years earlier, there weren't as many like open mics or stages to hit. But I think when I started, it was like, it was a good time to start. There was a lot of good stuff. I could go to the Ice House, which is some bar behind a Walmart in 36th and Thomas or some shit like that. We used to do that every, I think that was every Wednesday too, or Tuesday or some shit. And um, yeah, we used to do that. That was the hardest place to go because you were literally, it was, uh, it was called the Ice House because it was right next to a hockey rink. And it's still there. It's a good bar. But literally, you'll be doing a set, and at any point, a hockey game is going on, yeah. and somebody gets checked into the glass. <laughs> like, the bar is right right there, and then the, the glass right there. So it was, it was funny. And then, you know, there's a lot of Gordon Bombay references. Shout out to the Mighty Ducks. Um, but, yeah, that was a good, good room, too. But, yeah, you start at shit like that. Right, and you're there to work on your material, despite what the audience might react to it. Because half the people probably aren't even paying attention at some of these bars. We you, did we did yeah. an open mic night a few weeks ago at Gold Margarita in Phoenix. Oh, really? Right, How and was like it? half the people are paying attention, half of them aren't. There's me tearing the house down. Oh, damn! You do at stand up. Eric Bernal's uh, comedy club. We did it once. We're That's gonna hilarious. we're gonna try to do it regularly just to get the reps in. Yeah. We, do you? Honestly, is that something you want to pursue? Absolutely. Are you? Here's I'm, my I'm, question: Are do your parents still love each other? I hope so. They're still do together. They? They're still married? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't do comedy then. Really? I, I, have, I, I, don't, I don't have trauma. Are you happy? I don't have trauma. Have, overall in your life, are you I've happy? I've had a lot of weird shit happen to me that I could tell on stage. I'm a storyteller. That's, That's good. I always say, but if your parents still love each other and you're overall happy, you shouldn't start this. This is fucking, it's brutal. This is not It's for just you. for unhappy people that fucking hate you. You have themselves. to have the discipline to be like, I'm going to eat shit for five years. You got it. I'm right? 10 years in and I'm like, I feel like the last three, four years has been like, you know, I wouldn't say profitable, but I'm making, I can cover my monthly expenses doing comedy, which is really all you want. But it took You're like, taking care of yourself doing something that you built. Right. Right? Yeah, which is crazy. And, uh, but like, uh, it takes, it, it takes a long ass time of doing it. You know, I worked a day job for eight of the years. Yeah. And, uh, what you gotta do? and at night I was just doing that, drinking till midnight after the shows and shit like that. It was, it's a crazy grind. Um, you know, more power to you if you want to do it. But yeah, you got to do, you got to start with shit like that. And you really got to, it's not even working on material. Like my first like two years, I thought the mentality that I had was like I was saying, like, um, you got to be yourself, right? And I always thought that any room I was in, I was usually the, one of the funniest motherfuckers in there. So how do I do that on stage? So you really got to go on stage so many times that you're actually comfortable with being yourself on stage, exactly. which is way harder than it sounds because oh, yeah. once you're on stage, you know. It's a very uncomfortable situation. It's like everybody's there, make me laugh, all that shit. Like the pressure's on, backs against the wall. You're here to do one thing, and everybody in the room knows that you're going to tell a joke. Right. And it's your, up to you to make it not seem like it's planned or whatever like that. Like you got to actually like make one that works. Make me fucking laugh, clown. All that, that shit. That's why I asked you earlier if you included the crowd at all, because that's ex that was my game plan. I'm like, all right, I got my jokes. I think they're funny. Yeah. But if they bomb, I'm just going to throw it back at them and include, like, engage them a little bit. You can't. I mean, it's a way to get things rolling. If they're not engaged, right. like, at an open mic, I do think sometimes you got to, like, fuck with them. Because if you can pepper them in, if you can pepper in some um, crowd work, as we call it, um, the person that you were talking about that isn't engaged or bored or not even paying attention, they're going to pay attention. Because you just yeah. fucking talk shit about them and said something about their whatever shirt they're wearing or shit like that. So, yeah, that's a, it is a good way to get people in when it's only 12 people in a room. Exactly. And nobody's engaged. Right. I think we had, like, at least 30, 40 people there that night. But I'd say, like, I'd say around 15 were actually sitting there watching at the bar while the others oh, were kind of okay. just, like, in the back at their tables eating their dinner. You're right. But I, 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 right off the bat, just started attacking people, like, parents. So it's like, ah, Tuesday night before Christmas. This was, like, two or three days before Christmas. Yeah. I'm like, any of you guys parents out there? I can't believe that there would be parents here. I'm like, Probably 15 to 20 people raised their hands. Oh, so yeah. immediately I had the crowd turn on me. There and then I kind of had to rope them back. And I'm like, now you're paying attention, though. Now I can tell my jokes. It is, yeah. It's hard. There's a lot of different strategies, but somehow you got to get people to just get eyes on you. And then sometimes it's through negative shit. But the thing is, if you, if you get them pissed off, 
you better have some shit on the back end to get them happy again or turn turn it around and have the jokes ready. It's a hard, yeah. That those that those are the nights that make you stronger, though. Like tonight, I'll be working with Trevor, who is one of the more you know he's he's gonna be doing theaters later in the year, right? So he's at a point where he sells shit out. They're all sold out shows, right? There's gonna be I don't know how many people. Let's call four hundred something people in the in stand up live. It's funny people think like, oh, is that hard to do? It's like no, that's actually easy to crush. Because they're fucking ready to go. They're packed in like sardines. Well, with COVID, they'll be a little bit more spread out. But like usually it's like packed, ready to go, fucking let's fucking go. Th- those nights, tonight is like, if you can't crush that, you shouldn't do any of this. No. The open mic nights, though, when you got 10 people in a room that is fit for 70, and then none of them are sitting by each other for some fucking reason, and they're all scattered out, if you can make those 10 people laugh, then that's to me it always has made me feel better about like that's that's when you're like oh shit i'm good if you can and also if you can't make 10 people laugh you don't deserve to make 400 people laugh figure that out first what do you what would you say is more important starting out making the room laugh or making those few comics that are out there in the crowd going on before you be like you've got it keep going Um, like don't listen to these people both both matter but like I mean, at the end of the day, the people that you want to make laugh are the strangers. You don't want to make people right. that know you as a peer be like, because, you know, uh, also most of the time comics won't ever say n- anything like, because it's competition, right? Most people are like, if you're good, there'll be this bitter ass comic in the back to be like, fuck that motherfucker. He just started and he got this, fuck this dude. I'm not going to help him. Like, not to say it's all negative, but that exists in, in any competitive landscape yeah. that exists. But, um, I always would say you got to make the, the comics aren't going to put money in your pocket. No, you got to make these people laugh, the audience laugh, the strangers laugh um, and be able to get that laughter because playing to the back of the room. If you're just trying to make other comics laugh, you know, who's not going to ever pay for your ticket to go see you another comic. Nope. You got to make the audience laugh. So how uh, early on did you realize like what, what was the wor- What's more of a worse feeling like knowing that you have good jokes in your head and then going up there and bombing mm. or just flat out going up there and having some other like every now and then I feel like you're like telling a joke, setting up another joke mm-hmm. and like that one hit way more than the actual punchline was going to hit. And you're like, oh, God, now I, now I have to uh, to uh, adapt yeah. to this crowd because like you. I feel like you're smart enough to know it's like okay, like this is working. Let's keep rolling with this. Like I had this coming up, yeah. but like let's let's stick with this. Keep them rolling. The, the interesting thing that happens on stage is it's like I, I always think my my um, stand up set. Let's say it's like a twenty. I'll probably do like twenty something minutes tonight or something. And I usually call it. It's like a choose your own adventure book. I know all the jokes that I have, but like sometimes you'll be telling a joke. And there's a moment, to your point, like the setup of a joke or a, po- a portion of the joke that the audience really engages in. So then I'll be like, oh, they like that. Well, shit, I'm going to do this joke next. Or I'm going to flip. I'm actually not going to close with this joke. I'm going to do this thing about yeah. this because they liked this portion of this joke. So up in my head, I'm actually telling this joke to a crowd of a few hundred people sometimes. But internally, I'm actually having a whole, whole internal dialogue about like what the next joke might be because of the way that they reacted to that. So that's... That shit is wild. So, you know, no, I forget what your question was, though. What's more important? What, what, what would you say is more devastating oh, on stage? When that, well, I mean, shit. It, it's definitely not devastating if a portion of the of a joke that you didn't plan on them laughing at, they laugh right, at. Right, if it hits, That's it hits, great. Right? Yeah. Some people do get flustered with that, though. They're like, I've heard people be it's like, like... this wasn't part of the plan. Yeah, it's like, right? that's not even the joke yet. It's like, well, don't say that out loud. Just fucking keep doing the joke. And, and then next time you do that joke, figure out why that worked but um i mean devastating is always if if you think you got a joke and it just fucking falls flat uh you know that's like like money mayweather like getting punched in the fucking nose he's like all right i gotta figure this out yeah i gotta block a little bit better (laughs) no he would never get punched in the nose because that's a that's a beautiful man but yeah but um yeah you gotta like when it just falls flat and you're confident as fuck that it ain't gonna fall flat that's when you gotta adapt when was the first time you uh, realized that you kind of had a huge hit on something? Like, I know, like, starting out, you probably, okay, that bombed, that was nice, got some chuckles right. there, that bombed, this was really good. But what was the first gig that you did where you knew, like, I can do this, I'm going to monetize this, this is, I'm going to be a comedian? I think it was, um, I mean, early on, I was fortunate 
early on to, I think, have, um, what would the term be like? A, uh, my, my stage presence was like, I, you know, I would, I would always get comments from other comics that were doing it longer that they were like, you seem like you're well, much more seasoned than you are. Yeah. Like, I was like, I'd be like six months in and they'd be like, oh, you feel like you're like a year or two in, right? So that was always nice to hear. So getting that feedback was always good. Um, I remember having the first joke that really worked. I was like, oh, I could be really fucking good at this. And then nine months in, I was in a, you know, Phoenix isn't the same competition as like L.A. or New York. But like nine months in to ever having told a joke on a stage, I was um, in the finals for, I forget what it was called at the time, but like AZ's funniest competition. It was at Stand Up Live. And um, I, I don't think I thought it actually in the moment. Sometimes it's always hindsight where you're like, I guess that was the moment that things happened. But like um, just nine months in being in among the top whatever it was, I think 10. And also contests don't fucking really matter. That's another yeah. thing that I've learned. But I know in that moment it did matter to me. And then I went up there, and I thought I was super cocky and brash. I didn't bomb, but it didn't go great. Yeah. And I was humbled again. But being in that moment nine months in, you realize, like, oh, I'm probably not bad at this. Mm. I can do that. Yeah. That's good, man. You worked at stand-up, you said, right? Stand-up live? I never, no, I never worked at a club. Um, no, nah, but I've always I've produced shows right. at all okay. these clubs. So, yeah, yeah, so, like, I wouldn't say I'm, like, an employee, per se, of the club. But, like, I've definitely worked closely with – these clubs in town, uh, they've always treated me well. And um, I've produced a lot of uh, shows at, the, at these comedy clubs, yeah. So Yeah, so, so you say at a certain point it's competition between comics. It's like they're, not, they're never going to tell you, like, oh, my God, that was brilliant, you know? It's like, yeah. yeah, it was all right. But starting out, though, just, like, in Tempe, at, at the improv with all these other guys, I yeah. feel like you build close-knit relationships with guys that you want to see succeed. You do, yeah, because it, it, it's competitive because you want to be better. You want to be perceived as better than all of them, right? But also, like, you do want to see your friends succeed, too. So the, the best thing in comedy is that we're all, it's like a fraternity you didn't know you joined when you started. You're like, all of a sudden, you're f you've got all these acquaintances. Anybody that's ever told a joke, no, Mike, you're a comic. Now, there's varying degrees of how good they are. Um, but, you know, if you're a comic, you're a comic. But... Um, it is, it, it's competitive for sure. Um, I know that when I was here in Phoenix, well, my big perspective was um, at some point, like a couple years in, I was like, I want to be the dude in Phoenix. Like that anybody that looks at this scene, my name has to be mentioned in like who's killing it in this scene. And um, I think I worked super hard to be that. And I, you know, based on my perspective on it, I think I was in that conversation by the time yeah. I got you know, five, six, seven, eight years in. Wow. And again, like, just to give people the perspective, five, six, seven, yeah. eight years in. Yeah. You have to want, like, you want this? Or or is this going to fizzle out in the next six months when nobody's laughing at it? Yeah, because I was doing, yeah, I was, I mean, my first couple of years, I was on, I was hitting so many mics. It's crazy. I wish I documented it more, like, number, how many things I've, how many yeah. shows I've done, but it's a ludicrous amount of shows, uh, but a lot of them were just the open mics. I remember on Wednesdays I could do like three. I had it set up out here where I was working at Stand Up Scasta and then this other place called Speakeasy Comedy Lounge. Shout out to Brian Mullen. And he loved me and he was always kind to me and gave me stage time. So I could work, I could host at Stand Up Scasta at the early show. So there's two shows on a, a weekend night, like Friday tonight, we'll do two shows as early and a late. So I would host the early show at Stand Up Scasta and then by the time the headliner got on, I had like an hour window where I didn't have to do, where I didn't have to be back on stage. I would pop over to Speakeasy, do a 12 minute set as a set, pop back over, host the late show at Santa Scottsdale, and then pop back over and do that. So you're talking about like a Friday and a Saturday night, I could get four shows in each of those nights in front of paying audiences and strangers. And that was like when I was like humming. That was it, it was it was good. Would you consider those like your glory days in a sense, though? Because you're grinding. Maybe not everything's hitting. The, that's not where you want to be. There's there's a destination at the end of the journey. But like you are in the midst of all that, probably looking back at it like, man, I, I, I earned this. They, yeah. I mean, I look back on it in hindsight now and I'm like, man, that shit was great. And it was so fun. And I was able to meet a lot of cool people like that's stand up. Scott still was I was able to work with really cool names like people that are on Netflix. Like, you know, uh, one, I know one weekend was Mark Norman and yep. Dana Gould and uh, Pete Holmes and Jackie Cation and like all these different levels of like Maria Bamford. I got to open for one time like 
people that you're just like, what? That's crazy. Now, I now who I, I like, I'm fortunate enough to have seen some of these people at comedy festivals since, and like they're my peers now, right? They're clearly financially doing better than me. Some of them are on Netflix, right? right? But like, at the end of the day, that was uh, that was the elbows I got to rub early on. So that was it. It, it is super cool having those memories now. And to your point, like, you know, obviously, I I hope the glory days are in front of me, right? But like, from where I'm at now. Those were some fun fucking days. And you don't realize it in the moment. Why don't you meet that guy right there? Oh, dude. That, one, of the, Rock? one of the favorite interviews I ever did. Is you Darius the Rucker. He's a cool dude. I, all of Hootie and the Blowfish, actually. The, yeah, you talk about Hootie, bro. Um, that dude was cool as hell. I met him at a, a comedy club, at Stand Up Live. That really? Was, that picture was at Stand Up Live in the green room. No way. Um, yeah, he popped in. I was kicking it, actually. My buddy, uh, Chappelle Lacey, it was opening for. I think it was probably Brennan Schaub. I don't know what the... Yeah, it had to be, because we were all kicking it in the green room afterwards. And um, somebody knocked on the door. He was uh, he was at the time dating uh, a comedian, and she popped in, and she was like, hey, what's up? And she was going to come in, and we all know her. And then she was like, can, I'm, can my boyfriend pop in too? And we were like, yeah. And then it was like, fucking Hootie. It was like, my boyfriend popped in. You talking about Hootie of the Blowfish? Like, yeah, he can fucking chill. <laughs> for sure, dude. I want to hold his hand. You know what I'm saying? Like, cracked rear view? That shit mattered to me. I'm 35. Like, that was a fucking amazing album. So, yeah, all of a sudden we're kicking it with Hootie. And uh, it was funny. One of my other homies, he's a local dude here. Luis, you know who Luis Alvarez is? Yes. He's yeah. one of my favorite comics here locally. If you don't fuck with him, I think it's Comedy Luis on um, Instagram. Very funny dude here. here we're kicking it with uh, Hootie. And uh, I know who the fuck Hootie is, right? And Luis is younger. He's probably mid-20s or something. I'll never forget. We're just chilling outside and getting, you know, just bullshitting with him. And Luis looks at him. He's like, so what do you do for a living? And I'm sitting there like, motherfucker, what is fucking Hootie? And he also was funny because he responded. He was like, I do I play, uh, I do music, touring, touring musician. Like, so humble. Like, you know, he's like, that was a cool night, though. That's what we would all say. Just like, yeah, just play music. Yeah, no honestly, like, he was just a regular That's motherfucker. That's no excuse. I'm only 23 years old. I yeah. grew up on Hootie and the Blowfish. Yeah? I Are love you, Hootie. You t- you're 23? Really? Damn. Yeah, that's good that you know Hootie. I mean, he's that's timeless shit, though. You, everybody, I feel like he's he's also now, um, what, is he country star? So, yeah. like, he's actually even more known for that, which is strange to me. But, um, yeah, legendary dude. And to what we were talking about earlier, like, meeting celebrities and shit like that in L.A., like, he was... Some people are way, like, more reserved and closed off, dude. He was cool as fuck. And it was just, like, hanging with a buddy. Oh, I, yeah. I just met him, but I was, like, talk, we're just the way that he held the conversation was, like, super, it put you at ease and you weren't, like, intimidated. Because some motherfuckers. That's the best. Like, literally, it's just, like, I'm just like you, man. Yeah. You know? Yes. I'm doing what I love. This is what I wanted to do. I don't have to act like a big shot. Yeah. Another exactly. uh, comedian I interviewed was Rob Schneider. Just oh, a yeah. huge Legend. actor, SNL writer, whatever you yeah. want to call him. As soon as we hopped on, he's just like, Jack, handsome man, what's going on? Yeah. Like, he's just a cool guy. Yeah. Like, literally, you, you have no business talking to me. Like, I, like, I'm not helping you. You're helping me here, yeah. man. And, yeah. and you were that kind, that, that gracious to do that? Well, you had, uh, I saw one of the videos you had, was you had Bob Saget. Yeah. The he, yep. like, I never got to actually meet him. May he rest in peace. Obviously, somebody that, like, has, like, a, had an iconic, um, you know, vision in anybody's childhood that was in in my age but also like full house is still very huge oh, in everybody a- america's funny some videos house. all that shit he uh, all the stories you heard this week since his passing was like how down to earth he was and i'm sure you can attest to that like talking to him like i i watched a little bit of that um interview and he was just like so cool so like not intimidating so like he didn't hold it over your head that he was Bob Saget. It was no. like, yeah, it, I loved shit like that. Those I think the there was stories. one point in time where he was just like, yeah, like I'm, I, uh, I, I got it going on. I could help people, you know, but yeah. like I'm all about my kids. I got a hot wife, so that's go- that's going good for me. Like he's just all about helping others. He, yeah. he's like, how are you? How's everything going with your family? Yeah, it's like he, you don't even know them. I know it was he, it was sad to see that, and uh, but all the stories in his passing were very nice to to see somebody that was. Understood where he where he was at and understood that he could help people and he did. I mean, it was such an interesting dynamic with him too being like the dirtiest comic in the game yeah. at the same time being I Danny know. Tanner on Full House. His You'll never see that again. Funny. Yeah, I got to. He was at Skankfest. I was at Skankfest in uh, Houston a couple months ago and he was there. And I, 
Skankfest lineup is all just, nah, I wouldn't say everybody's like a raunchy. filthy comic, but it's, yeah, it's more of a raunchy, um, darker themed comic. Yeah. You're not going to get on there and be like the Joey from Full House would not be at Skankfest. Let's say Ooh. that. <laughs> Daniel Collier or whatever. He's a little bit too clean. Um, but like it was like Gilbert Godfrey, Eddie Pepitone, um, just legends. And Saga was there. I would suck. I didn't get to interact with him, but I heard he killed. He was going to perform at Stand Up Live coming up. Was he? Because he was on in I the middle of his tour. I didn't know that. I think he was only a couple he of. Came, uh, he came back here a lot though. He was only a couple of um, tour dates away from doing his Netflix special. Man. Yeah. And they have no idea what happened. I guess we'll I find out soon. But doesn't look. Yeah. You always think, I don't know. I, I just chalk every celebrity death up to fentanyl these days, but yeah. we'll never know. Who's, who's like the one comic you looked at growing up? And like, I don't want to say like, because nobody mimics. Like you said before, you got to be yourself in order yeah, to succeed yeah. in this game. But like, did you have one specific guy that you loved above everyone else? Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, George Carlin was the guy for sure. My dad was, uh, he was older when I was born. He was like 43. So he, he knew a lot of the older guys. Like he exposed me to... Um, all the George Carlin stuff that was going on in the 90s, 80s and into the 90s was um, something like we had the books and shit like that. So Carlin was somebody that I probably digested more than any comic at a young age, which was which was it's heavy stuff sometimes. Yeah. Like, but he's to me the the best ever in my preference. But then I really watched. It's funny, like talking about like being yourself, like undeniably yourself, right? A lot of the shit that I really, really liked was like Tommy Davidson had a special called Illin and Philly that I loved. Uh, the Kings of Comedy, like a lot of the black comedy um, was super, super funny to me. And I grew up in Cincinnati, so it was like, you know, it was a good amount of black, black people in my high school and then also just around the city. So we had that culture around us. So obviously, being a white dude from the suburbs for the most part, it was interesting to see that. But one thing you could even, like, I always think it was captivating to for me being able to not have the life experience of these people, but they were so themselves that they were able to bring you into their life experience in a way where it wasn't even, nothing was lost. And so like Cedric the Entertainer was one of my favorites, Bernie Mac. I mean, those are people that like were so uniquely themselves that you couldn't duplicate. Cat Williams, I fucking love Cat Williams. Um, you know, those guys for sure were, were people that um, I loved. I mean, because everybody's got their own little thing. Like me growing up on the East Coast, Bill Burr. Burr? Everybody loves Did I didn't Bill even Burr. know Bill Burr until like right before I started, uh, right when I was starting comedy. I remember some dude was like, you heard of Bill Burr? I was like, no. And then that was like right on the cusp of when he became who he is. But like, I never, yeah, I never was exposed to him that much until like probably I had a lot of family ago. in Boston. They're like, Bill Burr, I was like eight years old. Like, okay, I'll watch this with you. Yeah. He's the man. Yeah. And, and, you know, Louis, uh, I got into when I, when I started doing comedy, um, I think I started to expose myself. A lot of times you get to see him. So th the thing now that I get to be around is so many people on the come up. Like having been, been able to work a weekend with Mark Norman and then now knowing he's one of the best doing it, yeah. period. Um, you know, that's really cool. So it's really rewarding to be able to know my peers now are like climbing up the ranks. Like a buddy of mine... Uh, you know, Brian Simpson just dropped a Netflix right. special. He yep. dropped a 30-minute Netflix special, the same as Mark Norman shit. One of the funniest doing it. I've known him for a few years now. It's so cool to see your peers just fucking killing it. Like, uh, I've only known him a couple years, but one of my buddies, Shane Gillis, um, yeah. his special last year was I've heard fucking, great things about Shane dude, Gillis. So I get to, yeah, it's, it's so cool to be around. But my two favorite comics to watch now because sometimes you get exposed to it so much, like, you know, some, my good friends will be on stage, and I'll be like, I ain't watching this shit. I've seen this shit, and I love you and everything, but, like, you know, but the people that sometimes I'll, I'll never get tired of watching are Shane Gillis right now, and then my buddy Sam Talent is in uh, Denver comic, but he's been a JFL. He's He also is a really good uh, author. He wrote a book last year that was really good called Running the Light, but Sam Talent and Shane Gillis, if you get ever j get a chance to see them live, as far as I'm concerned, that shit is so fucking good, and you should never miss a chance to see them. Who was it when you went on? You were doing shows with was it Jamie Kennedy when you met I Frank have. Caliendo, or at least saw him perform? Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've met him before, but that was the first time I was in like a green room with uh, Frank Caliendo. Oh really? With uh, yeah, because he was watching Jamie Kennedy do. I think Frank's trying to 
get maybe back more on stage and shit like that. And I remember he was picking Jamie's brain because he does a lot of voices. If you've never seen Jamie Kennedy, and obviously Frank does great guy. He, to he probably great guy to look yeah, after. Yeah, he he probably leads with voices, whereas Jamie Kennedy actually does stand up and then weaves the voices in. Frank is more like that. So that was really cool. Yeah, those guys. Talk. I mean, Scream just came out with the fifth one, dude. Shout out to Jamie Kennedy. <laughs> Hopefully he comes back and he's the dude. I mean, just to talk about, like, the different dynamics of, like, what you can do. Like, Caliendo and Jamie have, like, their kind of niche, you could yeah. say, of, like, we do voices, we do imitations. Yeah. And, like, we kind of put it into our comedy. Like, Nick Kroll came out with that special where he was, like, doing pre-taped he did, like, three, things, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, every, like, it's so diverse. You can make it whatever the hell you want it to be. If it's, yeah, if it works. And it, in, the interesting thing about that is it's funny. We're talking about, like, you got to be yourself. You got to be yourself. But they are literally not themselves. But that is them being themselves. Their biggest skill set is imitating others. And it's also the thing that makes them laugh the most. So that's the other thing, too, is, like, do the things that you think are the funniest. And Nick Kroll obviously thinks that that shit is the funniest. And it is probably some of the funniest yeah, shit he is. can do. I mean, I know he's a really good stand-up, like, in his own voice. But some of that shit is so fucking funny. And, um, and yeah, Jamie and, and Caliendo, like, it's fucking entertaining. And as long as you're happy doing it uh, and it makes you happy and it makes you, you're – producing something that you think is funny then fucking do it can it i never I actually did, it was funny when i worked that weekend with jamie kennedy i was like i wonder how this is because i'd never seen him i know he's a he's a strange cat if you just watch his like right. um you know podcast and shit like that he's an eccentric dude and uh, i remember coming away from that weekend like that motherfucker's funny that is a good set and he does a lot of fun stuff with the voices and He's one. Of, he's a he's a good dude to watch too. I think the really coolest thing about comedy too is that there's no real path to get there. Like yeah. you got to be funny and you got to be into it. But like you were a communications major at ASU. There's some kids in theater trying to yeah. pursue a stand up career. Yeah. There's probably the Bill Burrs of the world that just like kept digging and digging and digging and kept failing and failing to the point yeah. where finally someone told them like, "This is you." I, I had uh, early on. I remember I read. They're really good books. The George Carlin has a memoir. I forget what it's called. Um, but it's a really, really good book about his life and shit. And then um, Steve Martin has a memoir yeah. called Born Standing Up. And you'll read them, and they're like these books that people are always like, you should w read this if, you, if you're if you stand-up or whatever. You should read them. First of all, if you're anybody, you should read them. They're really good, interesting perspectives on these people's lives. But being a stand-up, my biggest takeaway from both those books and then talking to other people about their career, like, Sometimes you're like, what did you do? How did you do it? Blah, blah, blah. The one thing you'll learn, re having read those books and their, how, how did they do it and talking to other people is nobody. Literally, you can't learn anything from anybody else because whatever your path is is going to be completely different than anybody else's for the most part. There's no like do this and then this will happen and then this will happen and then you'll be good. It's yeah. like none of it is the same. And having read the Carlin and the Steve Martin books specifically, I remember reading them and putting them down and being like, that literally those uh, avenues to success are not only so foreign to the existence of time right now, like that's not how the industry is anymore. It's not how anything is anymore. And the way that I pop is going to be completely different because Instagram and social media and TikTok and shit like that. Like you got to just be aware of the environment you're currently in and adapt accordingly. Yeah. I think the biggest thing, obviously, you got to, be able to perform on stage. Like you talk about social media, yeah. people can make clips in their bedroom and be hilarious, but like go up there in front of 30 people, let alone 100,000 people yes. at a stadium doing I, stand up. We, we t I keep talking about it, but this weekend I'm working with Trevor Wallace. That's, the, that's my homie. That's the dude. He's funny as fuck. But a lot of people know him from YouTube and Instagram and shit yep. like that because he makes videos. If you don't know him, follow Trevor Wallace. You probably He's the type of cat that you've probably seen him somewhere, right? Because all this shit is so viral that it's been shared so many times. And they're very fucking funny. So a lot of people like him, they pop like that and they get this huge audience. But when people come to see you on stage because you're like, all right, now I'm doing stand-up. And it's like you'll come to see him and you think he's super funny on the videos. And then you'll go watch certain people and you're like, oh, this dude is not a good fucking stand-up. The cool thing about him is he started as a stand-up. And so when you go to see – you you don't know that he's going to be good on stage maybe because his – more he doesn't share his clips as much as he shares his content yeah his videos when you get to see him on stage you're like oh shit he's funny in a completely different way on stage and he's fucking good a lot of motherfuckers the last couple years have popped on youtube and then they have enough of an audience where people come out and see them do stand-up because they just want to make it's a money grab right like well i have this audience 
in these markets. Why don't I go sell tickets and they'll come see me? But what they don't know is you got to put in that fucking stand up work and then you go see them and you just literally fucking disappointed everybody. They're like, yeah, he's a funny video, but he fucking sucks at stand up. And now that was your first impression of your stand up because this shit is fucking hard and it's not for everybody. Just because you can do funny shit on YouTube doesn't mean you got to you also can do it on stage. I mean, there's people who just are, like, couch funny. Just like, ah, oh, yeah. college dorm room funny, where they go up on stage and they think their jokes are going to hit, and yeah. it's awful. When we did stand-up, you know, it's our first time we're doing it, and then we see some of the people that are going up before us, probably, like, eight or nine people that went up before us. Yeah. Just the worst. So like, I don't even want to say bomb. Like, you could hear the white noise and the DJ from across the street. Yeah. And I'm just looking over at Zach, like, we got this. Oh, we're, Dude, I'm confident now. We we can do this. I mean, help yeah, make people, a few people laugh. I always say people, more people should quit. Um, but you can't tell these motherfuckers because you got to be delusional to even get up on that stage. So then they're so delusional that you can't even tell them that they should stop doing it because they're so they're, they lack so much self awareness that they think what they're doing is the path to success. It's like this is not good, and it's not gonna it's not getting better. I've seen like year over year. I've seen people. Where I'm like, well, that was bad last year, but you never know because there are people that can figure it out it's few and far you between, hope they figure it out yeah they, they, you gotta i mean you gotta fail to succeed but like uh, some of them year over year you're like how has this gotten worse and why are you still doing this because now you're wasting my time and everybody's time and you're taking stage time against people that actually are trying to do this shit so yeah it's tough so you're from cincinnati which is makes a lot sense now because I did think you grew up in Arizona, but when I was looking through your Instagram page, I saw oh, yeah. some of the, oh, yeah. some of the attire that you wear at the Bengals oh, yeah. games. Yeah, I pull like I'd that one a, right there. Oh yeah, no, look at that. Those are professionally shot <laughs> too. <laughs> professionally shot by Mike Falzone. Shout out to Mike Photography. Um, yeah, that's me at uh, in various uh, you know jungle sceneries. But then I'll pull up to a road game. Uh, this year actually, I, w I got I went to one, two, three. Uh, Bengals games, and I wore a Bengals tiger. To do it. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, honestly, Are I mean, they playing I Saturday go, or Sunday. This they're week? playing Saturday okay. um, against the Raiders. I actually saw them play the Raiders in Vegas. Um, you could probably go this weekend too if you weren't busy. I would. Yeah, if I could. F yeah, it'd be so fun. Um, and if they get to the Super Bowl, hopefully that'd be amazing. It'd be in L.A. So I'm gonna try to sneak into Let's, that. Let's uh, slow your roll. Yeah, you know. Actually, the AFC is wide open. The AFC if you ask is me. wide open. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be shocked if anybody like if Titans, Chiefs. I like the Bengals chances just because just because I feel like it's open. Um, there's no team that you're like. I hope we avoid them because right. they beat the Chiefs. Uh, they didn't do it in Arrowhead, but like they beat the fucking Chiefs. That was a good ass game. Titans, you know, that would be tough. We didn't play them, but like they beat the Steelers twice. You know, so I wouldn't be worried about seeing them again. Um, you know, who else is it? I don't even know. But it, it's like the Raiders, they already beat, and they got the Raiders on Saturday. Yeah, Pats, Bills. Pats and Bills are interesting Yeah, just because Belichick. But I'm sure you're a Pats guy, right? I am a Cowboys guy. Are you? So oh, I yeah. Grew up, no, you're a Jersey, you I said. grew up in Jersey. That's Everyone right. in my family is New York Giants fans. I somehow became a Dallas Dude, fan. My buddy is all, my other buddy from Jersey. Um, I mean, Cowboys also is Steelers, a Cowboys guy. right? He's a, yeah, well, I think it was he did it because he was just trying to – it was like a fuck you to his brother. His brother was a Giants fan. So he's like, I'm going to be a Cowboys fan. But I don't get that. Jersey has a lot of Cowboys fans. I do have a lot of family in Dallas, though, so I kind of have the excuse. Be like, I got family there. I could travel there, go to yeah. games. But even, like, on your side, you're, you're so confident. AFC wide open. The Cowboys went, what, 12-5 and five this year? I'm like, we could lose by 20 that's to San a, Francisco this week. That's, it's a weird that's how. San Francisco doesn't tough. even matter. It's Bengals like, lost to them, and that was a fucking crazy game. But they're good. They're weirdly good. Yeah. Like you look at them on paper, you're like, you got them. Talent wise, you guys are more talented, I think. But like they they play a good brand of football. And Literally uh, two weeks ago, I'm like, oh my god, they're in the hunt. I didn't even realize. Yeah. That. They snuck. They were like three and five at one point, and they just won a heat and went on a heater. But um, yeah, that's actually an interesting game. I was gonna. I know you guys are sponsored by a betting thing. I was gonna sprinkle the money line on that. Do it. Um, but. I don't know. We'll see. It'll, it'll be interesting. But, yeah, but I go – I've been doing that for a couple of years. I got this Tiger suit. I stole it from actually a Steelers fan because <laughs> fuck them. He had it for, like, Halloween, like, five years ago or something. And so I got it, and I started just wearing it to Bengals games. And then it's so funny. Like, I'm just – I'm fucking in my 30s. What the fuck am I doing? But um, I'll be just hammered on the road in road games, and, people like, kids will be coming up to me trying to take pictures and shit like that because um, I'm just a fucking idiot in a Tiger suit. But I usually do that. I went to Denver this year, uh, Vegas. That stadium's crazy. 
and then I did this the home game against the Jaguars. 3-0. I went to three wins. Those are the two I want to see is Allegiant and then SoFi. I've been to both. I went to SoFi preseason. Uh, my buddy's got season tickets, and he was, wasn't going to use them for the preseason. So I got to do that, and I went to Allegiant. I would say that SoFi is, SoFi is just fucking, I don't know. It's so fucking cool. The Vegas one's crazy, though. Um, it is really, really dope. They did a good job with both of them, but the SoFi one just feels cool. It's like open air. That's cool. Um, you also walk in at like the top level, so you go in. I love. They do that with Dodger Stadium. Yeah, yeah, too. yeah. It's I a little bit that. like that. Yeah, because I think there's actually some seats above. So it almost is exactly like Dodger Stadium because you walk in like the third level, but there's still a fourth level or something. Right. Well, that, that caught me off guard the first time I ever checked that place out. I'm like, wait a minute, where's the stadium? And then I realized, oh, we're in the upper deck as it's, we're walking in. I love. Uh, it's I, in I a really hill. actually like Dodger Stadium a lot. Um, they do a good job with that. That's a classic stadium. I go to the because I'm a Reds fan, so I go to always see the Reds. I saw the Reds play in L.A., San Francisco, and uh, San Diego this year. All great good. ballparks. Petco, really good. Petco, and then the former AT and T. I guess it's Oracle Park now. I don't know what. I don't even think if it's Oracle anymore. It's something else now because they just switched it They've up. They've changed again. a few. The Braves changed their main sponsor again. Yeah. So I don't know. I've been. But those to, but are great I'm well traveled on uh, stadium. That's one thing. I'm. I'm Weirdly obsessed with uh, sports, probably to a fault. But Cincinnati sports for sure. Reds, Bengals, Bearcats. MLB stadiums is my. That was like the number one thing on my bucket list growing up. Get to all thirty stadiums. I think I got like five left. I've been. To, yeah, I'm. I'm probably. I'm definitely like halfway there. But I've never been to like the East Coast. Is kind of. I've never been to like Yankee, Mets, Boston. Fenway's um, one you got to check out. I know. Just the just the scene. I know. But I've been. To, I've been to a good amount though. I've been to all the West Coast ones except for. I haven't been to Seattle. Um, and then they is Oakland building a new one? Oakland has been in talks of building a new one but for still years. That piece of shit. They, they have the architectural like landscape yeah. of it all. They have the pictures, but I don't think they've broke ground on it yet. Uh, no, because the Coliseum is. I awful. got to see the one of the cool. Yeah, that's that place sucks. I've heard. Um, I the one of the coolest things I got to see to switch sports though was basketball. I got to see the Oracle. Uh, well, the one the one that the Warriors played in. Now they have a new Before? one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to see uh, the Warriors play the Lakers, so I got to see like Steph and all of them and shit like that. It was actually shitty. It was right when LeBron was injured, but just seeing the Lakers anytime was kind of cool. But um, this was yeah right, the first year LeBron, and it was right before they shut the stadium down, and, right. and, and so that was cool. That's right see. next to the Coliseum, right? It's in the same hood, yeah. right? Um, that was pretty neat because like this. Fuck it, you know, I don't know. Seeing that Warriors team in that stadium, that place was rocking. Oh, my, I couldn't imagine. That was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, like, I love the stadiums that are all so close to each other. Like in Philly, they have the complex. Yeah. They got the Eagles, the Flyers, the Phillies. I've seen that. I like that. It's weird. It's a weird part of town, though, right? Because there's, like, nothing really there. Exactly. But they're all there. And there's, like, two bars right in the middle exactly. or something. Exactly. Um, Everybody could just chill out. Yeah. Especially, like, in That's October, Phillies are in the playoffs. Eagles have a home game. Yeah. Flyers are playing. That's nice. I've done um, – but the Cincy, Cincy did a good job, too. Cincinnati is Paul Brown Stadium. It's all-American ballpark really, really nice. It's, it's, uh, it's like um, – yeah, I like it a lot. Obviously, I'm biased. But, yeah, they did a good job. It's small. It's, it feels intimate. It's not like a huge, sprawling, big stadium. Like, the Diamondbacks one is just too big to me for some right. reason. Right. Um, even though it's grown on me over the years, I don't I don't mind that neat, stadium. It's a neat park. Yeah, it's cool, but it, it is what it is. But like the the Reds one is like, yeah, they did a good job on it. It's nice. And then also Cincinnati has the two best names for a stadium because they got lucky, or I don't know if it's luck, but like the company that um, you know uh, sponsors the Red Stadium is called Great American Great Financial. Amer so yep, it's called Great, Great American, American Ballpark. Park. It's great. And then uh, obviously the the Bengals don't even have a sponsor. It's called Paul Brown Stadium who is the inventor of fucking modern football. So I'm like, you we got rarely some good see that these days. No, too. yeah, you don't. I think like I Yankee think stadium, Raymond James in Tampa is also the same. Yeah. Yankee oh, really? Stadium, Raymond James isn't, it's like they have sponsors, but I was just there last week. It's called just Raymond James stadium, which is nice. Paul Brown stadium. Yeah. You don't, s well, you also get shitty fucking like crypto.com arena in LA. What the fuck's going on? Even though like when you think about it, Staples center is weird to, it's just so corporate, it but it's such ingrained. It ingrained was such a, yeah, that's the same thing with AT&T Park for the Giants. They turned yeah. it into Oracle. I'm like, no, yeah. it's not the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Safe, Safeco Field is now T-Mobile oh, Park. Yeah. T-Mobile Park has a nice ring to it, but Safeco was, it was that. It was I always liked, uh, 
when the oh, it's is it still Chase? Yeah. Uh, I like that. That's a good one. Um, but it used to be Bank One. Bank One. The Bob. Park, yep. Which is also, did you ever know that? I, I I didn't realize that I worked down there at the Fridays in left field for a long time during oh, really? college. Yeah. That was the great thing about Chase, but they don't have it anymore. They went out yeah, of business during COVID. Is it COVID. something else? Is it, is it a It's a just restaurant? an em- empty space because I think COVID wiped them out. That's crazy. But that was fun shit. I worked there for like four seasons, and it was when like Brandon Webb and Dan Heron were the pitchers. They were good. So, um, but when it was, it was Bank One Ballpark Bob, and then the, the I never realized it until I was working there, but they have their uh, mascot is a bobcat, and that's why. Because it was called Bob, was the, bo- was the ballpark. Because I was like, why is a bobcat the thing? That's like, isn't that an, a predator of a snake? Like, I, doesn't that kill snakes? I think Zach and I were literally talking about that last night at a bar, just like different mascots and why they're the mascots of that team. The ma- uh, dude, a Bengal tiger also is a strong mascot. I don't know. Like, like the friar for the Padres? The Padres, the fathers. The friar, it well, yeah, because he's a um, the a padre is a priest, so he's a priest. It doesn't look like a priest, but it's though. something about like the Spanish uh, churches or something. He's mm. called the father is the is the priest, and he no, it looks like an old timey priest. The motherfuckers from the missionaries and shit yeah. like that. But that is a weird one, and their colors sometimes are not great. Sometimes actually, I don't mind. I think they're coming back with like the brown and shit with the yellow. For some reason, I'm kind of weirdly into it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Fathers is a weird one. What the fuck is a Dodger? Oh, because it was in Brooklyn, and you would dodge the streetcars or something, right? Yep. Now they're in L.A. Switch it up. The Los Angeles Lakers? Minnesota, right? Min- Minneapolis. Yep. Switch the fucking name. Why? Are there's zero lakes. It'd ring. I mean, at this point, it is great. It. At this point, no, that'd be like Crypto.com you, times right. a thousand, right? Yeah, you couldn't do it. Uh, it is funny, yeah. There's a lot of weird ones out there. Dude, the Bearcat, Cincinnati Bearcat. I actually didn't know it was an actual animal until I was like <laughs> 17, Bear 18. It, it's like, and, it, and the logo, if you ever look at the Cincinnati Bearcat, like the mascot, it looks nothing like a Bearcat. They're no. just little nasty rodents. But, um, and then the Cincinnati Reds. It's just a fucking red. I don't know what the fuck that is. It's a dude running around with the baseball as his head. It's like the Mets. Mr. Mets classic, though. Mr. Red the, the is Philly classic. fanatic. That one makes no sense. That has no connection. No. The green, mo- like Wally the monster for the Red Sox. That that one's unique because it's a green monster. Sure. Right. Yeah. Though he looks like the Cookie Monster. He's not that scary. No. The Philly fanatic though. That dude's that's a legend. Is that the the flyer guy? The Phillies. The Phillies. Who's who's the flyer guy? Isn't that a weirdo too? He's like a his name's like. Uh, oh, look it up. Because he came he became famous. He's got like a trash name or something like that. Gritty. Gritty, yeah. That's actually really good. Yeah, yeah. I like Gritty. Gritty, yeah. That dude's good. The Gritty is what the Bengals do when they dance in the end zone. Shout out to Jamar Chase. Everything changed on September 24th, 2018, when the team gave birth to their towering orange full bar of a mascot, Gritty. Yeah, he's, so like he's like brand new. new. Yeah, they introduced him, and he's just like some piece of shit that just walks around. He's got some good, good stuff on social media. I thought you were going to say everything changed on September 11th, 2001. Um, that's an understatement. But yeah. also it changed when they introduced Gritty as a mascot. For you, similar, similar. Can you imagine changes. starting comedy around that time when everything's going on? Like, and, uh, obviously, like, comic relief fell? was very important, but <laughs> yeah. at the same time, you had to be very careful about what you were saying. Everyone says right now you got to be careful about what you're saying because of cancel culture. Yeah. But back then, like, thousands well, of lives were affected by that. You gotta be George Carlin earlier, uh, he has a special that just was released after his death. They released it, like, two years ago, three years ago, something. And it's called I Kind of Like It When a Lot of People Die. That's the name of the special. And he had recorded it in 2001, and it was going to drop on HBO in, like, October of 2001. And he obviously chose to not do that. And he just had a whole special that he taped that he couldn't release because of the the tragedy. And uh, it's interesting. So now going back and listening to it, you're like, oh, my God. People would have been deeply offended. Pretty good special, though. It's on uh, Spotify now. You can right, like to you it. can't take it too seriously. Like you have to make jokes that are gonna tug on people's emotions, but they have to know that they're jokes and only jokes. I, my my big rule is they have to be jokes. People sometimes people just bring up shit just to like trigger people's emotions or something like that, or they just it's like shock value. It's like, well, where's the fucking joke? Where's the punchline? Are you just like saying shit just to cross a line, or where's the you, if you take me across this line, give me a fucking punchline with it. You know what I mean? So that's always something that I'm conscious of because I don't know if you've ever seen our This Week Sucks Tonight show, but like 
we talk about everything. We usually we bring up 9/11 every show. Yeah. I did it in New York. We have <laughs> we just go because uh, it's kind of a character slash it's just me. Um, but I'm co-host with Anwar Newton, and um, yeah, he's definitely like my character is more like a George Bush Republican, and he also thinks that uh, 9/11 was an inside job, and it's fun, and we just lean into it. Yeah. Um, but there are jokes attached to it. It's it's funny. It's fucked up, but there's punchlines, and we that show is a beautiful example of how you can still cross lines with comedy. It's uh, my favorite thing to do is is write and and do that show because the first 30 minutes we just talk about news and current events and shit like that. Well, we talk about the ugly. And if there's ever a mass shooting or a school shooting, we talk about it. Mm-hmm. We don't shy away from it. No. And what we do is we make the joke. If you structure it well, that's how you know that you're better than anybody else that's doing it, too. Yeah. If you can make the joke that needs to be made. And, you know, some people would say the joke doesn't need to be made. Okay, whatever. Don't fucking come to the show then. But we're going to make the joke. That's what we're going to do. And, uh, you know, it'll probably elicit some groans, but you can't tell me it wasn't a fucking joke. It's right there. That's how you figure out that you're a mastermind and you know how to structure some of those events like that. Did you see The Closer, Dave Chappelle's latest... Oh, yeah. Special. I love that. Yeah. Got a ton of backlash, right, for what wow. he was talking about. And people he knew, that probably didn't even fucking watch it. And he knew he was going to get a ton yeah. of backlash, given that, that some of those topics that he was talking about are like the number one, two, three things that are going on in the yeah. world right now that you shouldn't be disparaging against. Like, how should we not be talking about this thing that everybody's literally talking about? And uh, and this thing that we're all trying to figure out as a, as a nation or as a world and stuff like that with... Uh, people transitioning from one sex to another. It's like it's a, it's going on now more than it ever has, and we're all trying to figure out pronouns and shit like that. What the fuck is going on? I don't know who he, she, they are. Yeah. Um, at least, like, 10 years ago, that wasn't something in my vernacular. I'm 35 years old. Like, you know, it's an interesting thing that we're all, we're all having those conversations in our living room, but then he takes it on stage, and he's just trying to figure it out, too. But at least he made the jokes. At least he made the punchlines. And I'll also argue that most of the motherfuckers that – uh, the backlash, shit like that, the most vocal people, I guarantee the majority of them didn't watch the whole fucking thing. Oh, and yeah. to, to get the whole thing that he's talking about, you can't take a clip that went viral on Twitter and be like, this is the whole special. It's like, no, that's fucking 90 seconds of the thing. He went. He's a, he is somebody that we should give enough credit to to know that he's fucking structuring a whole special. Watch the whole fucking thing. He'll take you there. Well, how important do you think it is to start off with, like, a good impression, like, off with a bang in the first five minutes? Like, okay, I'm going to continue watching this. Because I know in that special specifically, yeah. it, you really had to dive in deep to get to the nitty-gritty You had to watch the whole thing and about. consume it all, yeah, and listen. Um, but, I, I mean, I don't know. I know I like crossing a line early in my set. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it also, like, I usually open with a joke about mass shootings. And, uh, but... I'll be a motherfucker if it ain't funny. It gets, the re- you know, it, it never, it doesn't. Message received. Yeah, and it doesn't, I never, I never walk away from that joke and every, everybody's like, fuck you or something. There's, it's a fucking joke yeah. and it's funny. But what that does in my perspective uh, is sets the tone. It's like, oh, anything's on, on the table for this guy to talk about. If he just opened with that, the first thing he talked about was this thing that we as a nation stigmatize as a, obviously a horrible thing, but. We're also dumb as fuck if we don't realize it's happening. It's a thing. We're all aware of it. You watching the same news I'm watching, right? So, yep. like, I'm talking about something that we can all relate to, as ugly as it is. So, um, yeah, I like that because it sets a tone. And it crosses that line. And it, it earns trust. If you're an audience member, in my perspective, you're going to watch that, me tell that joke, and be like, oh, damn. If he can wa- talk about that, I trust him talking about it anything right because now he took me there and i don't feel bad about it it's your responsibility to set it up in the best appropriate way possible when everybody's supposed to know in the crowd that it's a joke like everybody that comes out to the shows i feel like has to have the expectation like i'm here to laugh i'm not here to criticize and be like oh why like what did he mean by that you'd be surprised i'm in la these motherfuckers are soft as shit um but most most markets are good like i was i always love going back to the midwest it's a bunch of just american people that like to laugh and drink fucking domestic beer and fried food. Let's fucking go. Um, yeah, but L.A., you go to Pockets in New York. You go to these soft places. You know, some Oakland, I had a tough show one time. You cross a line with them, and they, for some reason, think that it's a line that 
offends them, but it's like, all right, well, I didn't tell the joke to offend you. I didn't start talking about this to piss you off. As much as you hate to realize this, this wasn't written with you in consideration. So get the fuck over yourself and just listen to what I say. If you don't laugh, if you don't laugh, then don't fucking laugh. Everybody else is gonna laugh though. Let them fucking laugh. I didn't ask you for your opinion. I asked you if you wanted to laugh. This is dialogue, but you're not supposed to actually respond with words. Either laugh or don't laugh and fucking get over it. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's strange times for sure. But in L.A., everybody's so sensitive on shit. That's why I always like getting out of L.A. Because L.A., is, I always say to comics that don't leave L.A. a lot, I always yeah. tell them, like, you got to get out because L.A. is not America. Nope. This is L.A. This is a fucking, you guys live in a bubble, and you think that these things are what the rest of the country is talking about? Nobody in fucking Omaha is talking about this shit the way that you're talking about oat milk and fucking vegan foods and right. shit like that. So get it's like out. It's the of same that. thing with everything. Like get out of the box. Go yeah. experience new things. You're gonna meet b- different people that you've never met that type of personality yeah. before. Like I didn't know these people were even real. That's my favorite thing about as fucked up as it is, and I think there's a lot of negative stuff that um, uh, is happening with some of the, like TikTok and social media and shit like that. Like I, I know that there's a lot of things that I that concern me about how it impacts people these days and how it changes our way to communicate but i think the most beautiful thing about like tiktok and instagram is like you could be sitting in your bubble and you're on that app and you will be exposed to shit that you've never actually seen before like you could you could not have one black friend in the world but on tiktok you see black people making jokes about shit that you yeah. also think are funny uh you'll be exposed to uh transgender people on there and shit like that them talking about that type of stuff what i'm not as familiar with but then you sit there on tiktok or instagram and hear that story you're like oh that's a perspective i never thought about um, you know, I just saw this chick on TikTok that I was watching. She has Tourette's and like, I was like, damn, there's probably a bunch of people that live in a world where I've never had, I've never really known anybody personally that had Tourette's, but I'm sitting there watching this chick and I can go through 20 other videos. And I'm like, this is crazy. This is how her life is. That's an interesting perspective that I would have never had 15, 20 years ago, being able to sit in my bed at night and just watch and consume this shit. So there are positives too being exposed to that shit. I was thinking about that recently. <laughs> but What are your uh, plans for tonight? You plan to offend anyone tonight? With I try to, I'm trying to make people laugh, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. And do you have a set in place, or do you kind of just go up there and feel the vibes? I got this thing. Point? I mean, in Phoenix, it's funny because I lived here for so long. Sometimes I do things that I know work in Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, not to say it's like I don't ever want to do like local references and shit like that, but I mean, shit, I lived here for 15 years, so I know I do have a unique perspective on the people of the city and right. they, they might and it's jokes that i can't do anywhere else so it's like i might as well fucking pop and them just off. use it as like a bridge to cross over to yeah. the next thing there's some fun shit i'll do some local references maybe or you know i don't know we'll, we'll see but i do like to go up there i do have typically have a plan of attack but to what i was saying earlier like sometimes you get you're like oh you guys like you guys like this a lot i'm gonna actually do this now that i didn't think i was gonna do right so i like to keep it loose but yeah, there's definitely a plan of attack for sure. And it's just you and Trevor? I think Anybody there might else? be a host. I don't know. Um, sometimes this Luis is actually a great host that they use a lot. But I'm not sure who. Um, they, they'll they probably locally book a host too, so we'll see. And that's at Stand Up Live tonight in Phoenix, downtown? Yep, and tomorrow. Downtown, 7 p.m., 9.45, same time tomorrow too? Yep. So yep. you got those two sh- shows going on. You got Michael Turner. You got yep. Trevor Wallace Come on in the house. Phoenix, Arizona. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, Look at that camera right there. Come What's on, your baby. Instagram handle? What's your oh, hit me up, yeah. Turner Comedy, at Turner Comedy on uh, Instagram and on TikTok, actually. I know we were just talking about that, but that's just growing. I got. About, I hate it. I feel I, like a grandpa when I, I use that I, I, I th- It's a good way for me to get my comedy out there. So hit me on, uh, but definitely Instagram is, is my favorite platform. So at Turner Comedy. And then turnercomedy.com has a lot of my, uh, my dates that are coming up, too, and shows. I'm at uh, Hollywood Improv on the 21st. Doing this week sucks tonight, and we're also doing it on the 27th at Tempe Improv, and then we'll be in New York City on oh, wow. February 18th. Got a ton of stuff going on. You talked about yeah. the grind this entire episode, man. Come on now. I'm happy for you. Appreciate it. Going brother. on, man. Michael Turner. This was episode 
478. And again, Let's if you were go. thinking about going to stand up live tonight in Phoenix, don't because it's all sold out. But check out his clips on social media from what he just said. But uh, this was episode 478. Remember to head on down to Mayweather Boxing and Fitness in Scottsdale, Arizona. And to make your picks this week at betonline.ag by using the promo code capital B L E A V 50. Zach, hit the lights, man. Ooh.